So moving forward, Horway guy, I know that this is one that, that you're excited about with the Malta STO framework. Do you want to uh, give us a little rundown about what they were able to publish? Yeah, let's get right into the main topic, Kyle. Uh, you know, similar to our very first episode, uh, just like when the SEC came out requesting public feedback on harmonizing private securities, which, by the way, an update there, hopefully in August, early August, we're going to have our release done to show you how we feel regarding their, I believe, 19 questions uh, from the SEC. And there's a similar amount of questions being requested by the Malta Financial Services Authority, um, which is the SEC equivalent out of Malta. Uh, specifically, they put out, a, I think, a 28-page report that I've gone ahead and read through and, and uh, will now go ahead and uh, break it down for you here on the show. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the CEO of the MFSA, which is essentially the, the chairman equivalent, Joseph Cuscieri, again, hoping I didn't mess up that name, he was appointed back in April 2018. Uh, so he is very in line with what Malta is trying to do uh, as a nation and improving its financial capital markets, uh, and specifically with a focus on virtual assets as well as now security token offerings. So they, they did do a already a release on how to conduct virtual asset issuances and how to manage them in Malta. And now they are looking to update and develop a framework specifically designed for security token offerings. Uh, and their main purpose of this, uh, to quote uh, Joseph here, is there, our intention is to push towards having a wider and more efficient framework for businesses to raise capital, allowing entrepreneurs to expand their businesses. Additionally, a well-functioned capital market provides public investors with an opportunity to invest their savings with the objective of obtaining a higher return. Just like any other uh, capital market, that is, a, a, of course, the goal. And, uh, you know, again, Malta is taking advantage of being a small island uh, with a more robust framework uh, to be able to, you know, let's say, compete globally for getting issuers to, to trade in Malta. And the specific goal for their update to the framework is to pretty much create legal certainty around STOs. This is a big deal because especially here in the United States, but all around the world, jurisdictions everywhere are wrangling with the definition of a virtual asset versus a security token versus a compliant uh, digital asset issuance following securities law. We had a whole, you know, article talking about creating even more confusion last time around on the episode. Uh, and really, this is a really important step for Malta, as well as for security tokens in general, to create this legal certainty for institutions and investors alike. Uh, the requirements that uh, Joseph here lists out is that the, the legal certainty is created by four requirements. The first is transferable securities must be registered in one register. The second is that secondary trading must take place on properly registered exchanges complying with all current regulations on transparency, prevention of market abuse, and reporting. Number three is certainty of ownership is fundamental. As such, all ownership must be recorded on a properly registered central securities depository, or a CSD, which must run the settlement systems to ensure the integrity of the entire system. This puts a lot of emphasis on the CSD here. And number four, the role of intermediaries in the distri distribution of transferable securities to retail investors. Um, so this is a, a big deal. Um, because, you know, they are now officially going out there and saying we have a framework designed for traditional assets to become STOs and pretty much following all the same rules that existed beforehand, but now with legal certainty behind them. So they broke down their, their you know, proposal in six different sections. The, the first section was defining STOs. Very interestingly, they, they chopped them up into two different definitions. The first is traditional STOs. So this is really talking about any traditional asset, a bond, equity, a debt instrument, uh, and basically using a token to, to manage that process. Uh, you know, the reason we're probably all here listening to this show and participating in the space is for this very benefit for traditional assets to leverage blockchain technology and efficiencies. 
Uh, and so they refer to those as traditional STOs. However, when you start to blur the line a little bit where you say, hey, I have a profit interest off of a virtual assets, you know, cryptocurrency, proof of stake node system, uh, you know, here in the U.S., that for certain would probably get clarified as a security. Uh, and globally, it's, again, causing a lot of confusion. So they define something that seems like a security, but is definitely, you know, a little bit more questionable as a other STO. And for the purposes of this proposal, they're actually going to exclude other STOs for now as they explore trying to define that even further so that there is more clarity between what a virtual asset is, what they consider another STO, or a traditional STO. So for the sake of the rest of this proposal, they, they really are referring to traditional STOs only. Um, section two uh, is actually about issuer approval. So uh, they actually, you know, just like here in the US, until a regulatory body says otherwise, the issuer is deciding what they are defining their, their token as, whether it's a virtual asset or a traditional STO. However, the MFSA does have the right to request a legal opinion from the issuer in case there is uncertainty. Uh, we've seen similar things happen here in the US, specifically Blockstack with their Reg A plus offering. There was a lot of back and forth in the SEC specifically for this exact reason. Um, and even now they've settled on pretty much not commenting at all on, on what it is. <laughs> so here at least Malta, again, going back to legal certainty, if you plan on issuing a traditional security and using a token for it, you will have a, a defined role within the, the regulatory framework here in Malta, and it should be fairly easy to get a legal opinion to enforce that one way or another. Um, the MFSA also proposes to approve STOs in a foreign or local LLC to start. So you're hearing me correctly. They're requiring that you know, securities that get listed as a traditional STO be structured in a limited liability company. They are, are exploring the use of using foundations, trusts, and other vehicles. But at this time, it's their intention to just simply allow LLCs to start. Um, they also intend to update some of the laws so that cap table registry can also be done via distributed ledger technology, something that is currently not in place in their existing uh, framework. And they will also require uh, three different tests. These are pretty common tests across the globe, a financial soundness test, a corporate governance check, and of course being compliant with transparency requirements. When they're referring to financial soundness, they're actually talking about startups and asset light um, issuers. Uh, you know, specifically, it's very difficult for them to be able to you know, project the, and, and really assess all the risks. So what they're going to do is have them file a financial due diligence report, which you know, typically for a company or fund you know, is able to provide three years of, of historical financial data. It's a little bit more difficult for these startups, so we'll, we'll see how they kind of support uh, those companies getting listed. On the corporate governance side of things, they're proposing that you know, traditional STOs follow the cybersecurity framework and IT requirements set out already by the Virtual Financial Assets Act uh, that I was referencing earlier, as well as requiring a systems auditor to be appointed to run a systems audit report. Uh, this is pretty much uh, a protocol set in place for them to be able to make sure that the DLT technology and the registry, again, remains with integrity and isn't manipulated. Probably something that will be done by the a combination of the, the CSD as well as the, the distributed ledger technology behind it. And finally, regarding transparency. Um, you know, they are, you know, again, requiring very similar requirements that almost a public company would. Uh, specifically, we're talking about the uh, uh, reporting of assets and liabilities, profits and losses, financial position, prospects of the issuer or any guarantors. Of course, the rights uh, attached to the security for investors 
And of course, the reasons for the issuance and the impact on the issuer, why are they raising the money, the nature of the issuer, the type of securities that they're issuing, and the circumstances that they're currently in. Uh, all you know, in an effort to bring investor confidence into what they are buying into as a security that is now represented via a security token. Uh, as far as Section 3 ongoing reporting goes, pretty much they just said that issuers using their own DLT technology as a registry will need to go through that annual systems audit. So that's why I mentioned that I believe that it will likely become part of many services that some of these different participants and stakeholders provide uh, because an issuer managing their own DLT and then hiring an annual systems auditor and doing all that certainly seems like uh, a heavy uh, lift now. As far as secondary trading goes, Section 4 found this one to be very interesting because they went out and defined the different types of exchanges out there with, of course, the most emphasis on decentralized permissionless exchanges. And the long story short of it, Kyle, is that they pretty much said no to that. Uh, <laughs> and not surprisingly so, they criticized that being able to oversee completely decentralized permissionless exchanges to enforce all the rules that we're discussing here now and the ones that exist today uh, will be very complicated for them to do. Uh, so instead, they will be first allowing traditional STOs to list on um, decentralized permissioned exchanges as well as centralized exchanges that are already providing a lot of these services on behalf of investors through a centralized body overseeing the whole process. Um, I think that's a very big move because a lot of people might have been looking at Malta as someone that is going to be able to, to do something a little different than most uh, financial regulatory frameworks. Uh, but this is very, very much so in line. Uh, the, in fact, we're dealing with one of the very first you know, modern frameworks, including STOs. And this is a very natural question to come up. How would you regulate and oversee such exchanges uh, without uh, a lot of enforcement tools to begin with. And of course, going back to any regulatory body's goals, which is to give investors confidence and protections. And so if they're unable to see the transactions, if they are unable to create any kind of enforcement on the exchange, how are they able to guarantee such protections? Uh, I'm gonna wrap it up here in the last two sections, talking about market abuse. Market abuse, you know, referring to insider trading, market manipulation, uh, and other for forms of fraud typically found in financial markets. So the, the result is the proposal will have issuers needing to publicize uh, insider information as soon as they possibly can publicly, and to also have their own transaction history on record so that in cases of, of fraud, they're actually able to go back and see the timing of these transactions as well as the timing of the disclosures, et cetera. And, and I think this is great because this is exactly where blockchain helps financial markets. This is not a negative, this is a benefit. We'll be able to reduce fraud. We'll be able to track market manipulation better uh, thanks to the security token transactions being on the ledger and immutable. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle now just as I wrap up here. The last thing that they did mention that I think is worth, worth absolutely sharing with you all is that there is a heavy emphasis on this uh, registry CSD uh, system because they will be the one that is likely employing the digital ledger technology um, and will have a, a big liability because they're going to be the ones who must ensure that whoever's using their registry has their identity verified and is legit. Uh, and we'll have to work with the issuer to make transactions available, but also work with the institutions and with everybody else uh, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to have to work with the investment banks who are the bridge to the retail investors. So another reason why permissionless decentralized exchanges won't work is because they will, you know, the, the CSD C, uh, or SSS, will not be able to uh, track this information and be held liable for, for being able to share it with regulators as well as all of its participants. So uh, a healthy load there, but uh, hopefully it was clear. I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle who maybe has some questions about this or more interestingly, some comments. First off, great rundown, Herwig. I, I know that this is a 
30 plus page report. And I think you did a great job of boiling it down into, into a 10 minute summary. Um, personally, I think it's very interesting. You mentioned that maybe some people were hoping for more of a out there guide, something that was maybe a little bit more lenient, a little bit more liberal than what we might expect from, from one of the larger financial, financial institutions. But I actually take the other side, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, is, is that I think that, that what they've done here is, is almost a slightly more official version of the comments that we have provided to the SEC and that we'll continue to, to provide feedback. And, then, and what they're trying to do here is lead by example by providing something that, that is conservative, that is understandable, it's digestible, and that doesn't take too many risks because they realize that this is something that will affect the global financial system and it's not prudent to take too many risks too early in a system that, that's still very, very young. Hopefully this is something that's relatively modular and that this is not like what we've seen in many of the U.S. securities laws where they were passed in 1933 and we don't see an update for 80 years. But this is hope. This gives me hope that they're, they're at least acknowledging a lot of these new technological advancements and they're, they're trying to make and build regulations that will likely be something that they can work with other financial governments and financial systems with along with these these rules here that it's nothing it's not something that's going to cause a different government to say look no we can't work with Malta because they are you know an offshore account right this is nothing like what we've seen before where you get some of these smaller economies that provide all kinds of tax havens and all kinds of shell operations to allow for criminals or money laundering or any of those things to occur. And I really think that what they're trying to do here is really break away from that potential stereotype that they may fit in and say, look, we're going to try to take this and, and look at it officially and try to build something that may be what we'd love to see from one of these larger economies and, and one of these regulatory bodies. A, a really great observation, Kyle. I'm going to take some some pieces apart there. Uh, you know, you mentioned the word conservative. I think that's absolutely the case here. You know, if the SEC had to go about creating an official framework for security tokens, you know, it'd probably look a lot like this, you know, when it comes to worrying about quote unquote other STOs. For now, it's not their problem. They're going to explore it. When it comes to worrying about decentralized permissionless exchanges, they're not going to worry about it. It's not going to impede creating a legitimate uh, framework designed for traditional STOs. Uh, and that is very exciting because, you know, to your point, we have to remember Malta is part of Europe. Uh, they're, they're under European Union guidelines to, to make sure that they can easily and not get, as you pointed out, basically ousted from the financial community globally. Uh, and so therefore, this is right along the, the right balance of innovation as well as conservative updates to an existing financial framework. Um, and as a result, I, I think we're going to see a lot of very solid uh, momentum come from Malta. Uh, you know, August 30th is not a very long comment uh, period. Uh, and we've seen Malta move very quickly with the, the Virtual Asset Act. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see something official uh, as soon as this year uh, regarding an official STO framework. And I'm very excited to see how issuers start to leverage this new exemption or this new um, registration type uh, to be able to issue through Malta under one of these you know, legitimate uh, and with certainty uh, exemption. So, uh, you know, really, really big news overall. I think that's why they deserve the, the full topic today. I also think that, that we've discussed before that with security tokens, you're able to remove the security token from an exchange and, and take that somewhere else, whether it's custody providers, whether it's exchanges to be able to, to liquidate your holdings. And so I think for U.S. investors, especially, who have to subscribe to much harsher regulation requirements than what we've seen almost anywhere else in the world, if Malta can build something that mirrors what we're likely going to see from something like the SEC or potentially from something that we see coming out of the U.K. or, or another financial leader here around the world, 
all of these securities that Malta may lead on in terms of providing liquidity for and, and providing issuance for may be very legitimate to be able to be traded on our exchanges moving forward as well. So if, if as long as they're being smart and conservative and compliant with what they expect or we expect to see from some of these other larger financial regulators, it'll allow a lot of cooperation in terms of, of these offerings and the success of many of these issuers, which I think is just great for, for everyone. I also would just like to add that we are not lawyers and this is not legal advice or financial advice by any means. It is important to do your own research, to contact professionals, lawyers, financial advisors, wealth managers, if you have any questions. But I hope that our insight is valuable for entertainment purposes. Absolutely. And I also want to add one last thing to this, Kyle, which is to, to really bring it full circle in today's episode, you know, uh, specifically with the emphasis on the custody provider and the registry agent, the, the CSD, um, they are responsible for managing the DLT technology. So going back to Jesus's article about creating security token networks, this is a perfect example. We already saw an exchange out of Switzerland exclusively partner with, with Corda uh, and their R3 uh, blockchain. So this is yet another example and reinforcement of potentially private markets adopting a private blockchain to be able to leverage to create a security token network. Um, so really, really fascinating stuff. We're, of course, as always, going to, to be keeping an eye on this and keeping you all updated. Uh, but for now, I think we can wrap it up and, and call it a show, Kyle. What do you think? It was a great one this week. It was a, I think we had a lot of, of really exciting infrastructure improvements and yet another regulatory body looking for feedback. So just as we said with the SEC, if you have any thoughts regarding securities laws and private security fundraising, definitely submit those comments to Malta because I think her would get the nail on the head that they're looking to move quickly. They're taking feedback seriously. And, and this is a, just yet another good opportunity to, to really help shape our financial system for, for the rest of our lives. Go check it out on STM news. If you want to go see the, the full report in detail and review the questions that they want feedback on, it's, it's really just asking uh, about feedback on their proposal of everything I just described to you. And if you want to send them comments, you can email them at capitalmarkets at mfsa.com.mt.